The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. So the second one, um, the second presentation is from um, John Hosville from Baker Concrete. And um, the intent is to talk about what is constructability. John. So, so when I think about constructability, I'm naturally drawn to design details, uh, simplifying them. But I'm always torn because it seems, from my experience, the most impact that we have is when we look at the processes and how we interact. So my presentation will kind of focus on the processes that we use in constructability. So the first, uh, the first thing I do when a new committee comes together or a new topic for ACI or any other organization is I look at kind of at past what's been done in the past. And, uh, I went to CII, Construction Industry Institute, uh, to, Tell you a little bit about them. They've been around since 1983. They're a group of owners, designers, constructors. They form research teams. They're strategic, strategically uh, formed. They, uh, the member companies do the research. They're supported by a primary investigator from Academicia. And they publish research and implementation tools. They thought Constructability was important enough back in the early 80s that the third team formed was the team on constructability. And they defined constructability as the effective and timely integration of construction knowledge into conceptual planning, design, construction, and field operations of a project to achieve the overall project objectives in the best possible time and accuracy at the most cost-effective levels. A lot of words, right? But I think that pretty much sums up what constructability is. Probably about 18 people in the room to write that, I'm guessing, because everybody had to get two or three words. <laughs> but uh, that, I think, sums it up. So I'm going to go into some of, the, some of the things that they've learned over the years. First, uh, formal constructability programs. Research has shown it resulted in a 6.2% there's 6.1% cost reduction and 7.5% schedule gain. Pretty impressive. $3 spent on front-end planning results in a $10 payback. These are all hard research projects across multiple projects. So by combining front-end planning and advanced work packaging, $8 million will be saved on a $100 million project. Uh, an average of 3 to 5% rework on completed work in our, in our industry. Worse, if you consider productivity, all the things that happen before we complete work, our waste is about 40 to 50 percent in our industry. So adoption of proven technology can result in a 30 to 45 percent gain. And one of the things CII is most known for is their zero instance techniques have resulted in reducing a TRR IR to 54 to 64 percent. So one of the mega trends is timing's important, right? So the PMI graph where uh, we look at the uh, influence, stakeholder influence dissipates over time and the cost of change increases, right? So if you apply that to the construction cycle, the other diagram there, we can see that the little shaded blue part is probably about where construction happens is uh, our ability to affect change is very limited when, once construction starts. So this is a graph, another megatrend, is that we in the construction industry lag other industries. 240% uh, less productivity gain in construction as compared to other uh, non-farm industries in the U.S. Uh, over the past 50 or 60 years. So how is this possible? With all the, the things on the top of the page, you look at all the advancements we have, and if you look at the photos at the bottom of the page, a uh, photo of... Uh, Dan Baker's grandfather in the 30s. The two cubic yard truck was similar to the truck my dad drove when he uh, he got back from Korea in the 50s. And uh, then a picture of the early days of Baker. A lot of changes happened since there, and we have a lot more tools than we did back then. So, so 
I always wondered, you know, is this really real? The, this, this 240% less? Well, you look at one project, the Empire State Building in the 30s, was essentially constructed in about 13 months. The 79 years later, the Bank of America Tower, a few blocks away, took six years to build. So our challenges, uh, construction's fragmented, every building's unique, we have an aging workforce, uh, manufacturing on the other hand has an incredible amount of invest investment in capital to reduce, to increase productivity. That photo, I, my first construction job was a framing carpenter building houses in the late 70s. And I, I could challenge you that that photo could have been from the late 70s or it could have been from yesterday. So fragmentation at the project level, imagine 50 different companies working on the manufacturing floor to, to make your next automobile. Not, not so easy, right? And at the industry level, uh, there's over 50 industry associations that are directly related to concrete straight stakeholders. So how do we bring that together better? The other uh, significant bar barrier, I think, is uh, risk transfer versus risk mitigation. You know, we have design, bid, build contracts. Our nature is to put something in somebody else's contract, pass it downhill, rather than mitigating the risk working together. Information flow. It's too much information, often not, not relevant to the, to the individual receiving it. Additive design is done throughout the construction process and uh, endless changes to design is definitely uh, impedes our progress. So if we look, why is contract early involvement in design necessary? It's to mitigate some of these, these factors. So the designers have less time, less money, and more complexity, which results in lower quality, lower percent complete on design drawings, and less coordination. So what, what lessons have we learned? In, in safety, uh, CII companies, there was a recent study done, uh, RT-354, I believe, uh, studied how many companies effectively implemented their safety programs on at least 50% of their projects. And the compliance rate was, for safety was very high. The safety rates for that same group in CII, they're, they're about 10% of the general industry average. So the industry average is three, uh, they're about 0.3. Ten times better than the average construction company out there. So what we learn is that we implement programs formally, they tend to affect results. So in that same study, they, had, they identified five different types of productivity improvement that most companies participated in. As, as you can see, the level of uh, implementation was much lower. So the results obviously are not as good. At Baker, we, uh, we looked at this and uh, we kind of broke it down into three major threads, planning, technology, and sweat equity. And we realized that to implement any program, we need leadership resources, structured communication, planning, monitoring control, and continuous improvement. So underneath each of those, planning, for instance, relationships, communication, and processes are critical. Uh, in technology, we're going to talk about tools and knowledge management metrics, and sweat equity is more co co-workers, leadership, values, and culture. There's four key phases, early phase, BIM, early BIM, basically project conceptual, defining path to construction. The second phase would be the design assist or constructability reviews, more getting into the detailed design. Third phase, uh, basically developing complete project execution plans prior to construction. And then finally, uh, those things that we do during construction, you know, SSQP meetings, which stands for safety, quality, productivity for Baker, first run studies, thoughtful RFI generation, et cetera. So some of the software tools we use during uh, pre-con and throughout the project, uh, I'm going to kind of buzz through some of this. We're involved in early estimates on projects, uh, conceptual estimates, preliminary budgets, these are all some of the things we support some of our clients with. Models for visualization and detailed models for planning. Where we're looking at the specific uh, placements and uh, breaking them down to level of detail, 400, where they're actually dimensioned and we are using them and entering them into survey instruments. 
So four key uh, engineering interface steps, basically break, working on collaborating on work breakdown structures and detailed 4 BIM, uh, 40 BIM, clash detection, some of the early BIM work, and then constructability, constructability assessments and bringing BIM to the field where we're actually using models to, to do our layout and direct our field forces. On the tool side, uh, about a couple of years ago, I started working on a, uh, a tool to uh, measure rework. So uh, it's an app on the iPhone. Uh, we get about uh, 600 reports a, a month right now of opportunities for improvement within our company. Uh, we trend those monthly, and uh, we generate at least two best practices every month as a, as a group based on the trends we identified that month. Productivity measurement, feedback back to iPhones, uh, to, uh, to our workers so that they're, they're being, they're given the proper feedback on how we're doing with our productivity on a daily basis. And of course, uh, BDC, uh, this is a photo of, uh, and a model image of, uh, the Veterans Memorial Museum. Uh, not a, not a right angle in the building. Uh, this could not have been built without them could not be built with the typical, you know, plans and specs type approach to, to building. BDC strategy, uh, this is kind of a odd diagram, but uh, we basically look at structurals, architecturals, RFIs, sketches, uh, embeds, uh, other shop drawings, and the, uh, what we call the, the BDC trans translator, sort of the, the black box where the sausages make, where you take all that information and you generate your line drawings and your, your outputs to help your field crews understand what they're building and feed the survey instruments with, with proper information. So what is sweat equity? The last part of it, uh, there's a good quote there from John McCain that kind of sums up, uh, I think we've all worked on projects where we felt like what we were working on was much bigger than ourselves. And uh, that's something that's very exciting about construction to me, always has been. We've been able to be involved and blessed to be involved in a lot of uh, interesting projects over the years. The Saturn project many years ago, probably 25 years or so, 30 maybe. Decent crop, uh, about 400,000 yards of concrete placed in, uh, I think about the bulk of it, in about 10 months. And the uh, Frost Museum uh, was uh, incredible in terms of the complexity of building that structure. And then the recent project in Houston for ExxonMobil, uh, it was about 450,000 yards, a lot, a lot more complex uh, concrete than the thesis crop job, though, with uh, a lot of structural concrete, not so much mats and mass foundations that were in the other project. So sweat equity starts with our workforce. And this is a diagram, again, from another CII team that suggests that about 11% of our workforce we're going to lose in the next couple of years. And 17%. Uh, uh, up to 40% over what they consider the life cycle of bringing a new guy in to the trades to having him replace the journeyman that's leaving to, in terms of competency. So that is a, a challenge to that gap between what it's going to take to get the new workforce guys up and running in the, on the timeline that people are retiring is something that we, we are looking at as an, and need to look at as an industry. The other big part of that, the big, you know, the dignity of labor has, has taken a pretty heavy blow over my career. And uh, we need to restore that. That That's a big, big thing I think we need to work on as an industry to, to get to get the dignity of labor back and make it make it more exciting in our industry again to, to do the things that I've been able to do over the past 35 years. So the key steps for workforce development for us is, is first off to start with better defining better competencies based on coworker roles, uh, leveraging uh, and continuing improving our knowledge assets, converting knowledge assets to uh, the, the specific roles and training for specific roles, implementing the training, and then continuously improving. So sweat and leadership, the one thing we always remember, the concrete's hard work. We get paid to safely and productively form, place, and finish concrete. That's what our company's about. And if we lose sight of that, and then we're heading down the wrong path. We have some of our key values below that with the incident and injury free, quality and customer focus. We have an expect more mentality. And back 
years ago, we used to hear people say, you know, we got schedule, we got quality, we got cost. You can have two out of the three, but that's not acceptable anymore. So SSQP, we want to go four for four. We want to bat a thousand. So in closing, we respect and embrace technology, always strive for better planning, and remember that email has never pounded a single nail. Thank you.